recorded it. I wasn't recording at that time. That would have been great. I think you were laughing or something. All right, now I'm recording. All right, let me go. Can you guys see the um, PowerPoint? Yes. Yep. I was laughing and my and I choked on my coffee too. <laughs> yeah, I didn't get it on. I didn't get it. I didn't record it, but I saw it. Um, everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I noticed. All right. Uh, none of this really helps what I'm trying to say. All right. This chapter is on a um, the membrane. It's really about how stuff goes into a cell or out of a cell. But this is what the membrane looks like. So you remember we had these molecules called phospholipids. And part of a phospholipid likes water. And part of the phospholipid likes lipids. So you've got this one molecule that likes both water and lipids. So in other words, we have these words hydrophobic and hydrophilic. Hydrophobic is afraid of water, doesn't like water. Hydrophilic likes water. So it's this was like the phosphate group, and then these were the two fatty acids. So that's what the symbol looks like. And so we have two layers of phospholipids. So that's why we call it a phospholipid bilayer two layers of phospholipids. So where this says water, this is like the outside of the cell. And then where it says water again, that would be the inside of the cell because our body is water-based. So you have the heads facing inside of the cell and outside of the cell. And in the middle, it's like lipid. So that's what our cell membranes are made from. And then, so that's what this is. So this is like everything, see they're using the word cytoplasm. So that's saying that this is everything inside the cell, this, this yellowish kind of area. And then this area that's like aqua colored, looks like an under, underwater thing. Some kind of like aquatic worm or something. But um, this area outside is the, see they're calling it extracellular fluid. It just means that it's outside the cell. This is water. And this is water-based, but so you see the tails are turned in on each other. And then there's other things in here, but the important thing is these purple things. They are proteins. Some of these proteins are like, are like doors. Some of them are like windows. Some of them are like, um, like markers on the cell. It'll say that this cell belongs to you and, and no one else. So um, there are proteins embedded in it. I think of it like this. I think of it like a wall, like the wall of your house. The wall of your house is made from two layers of drywall, right? You got the studs, and then you got two drywalls. And then you have a door or a window, right? The door or the window is the protein. The two drywalls, that's your phospholipid bilayer. And you could say like, so what would the studs be? Um, it'd be like things like molecules of cholesterol and things like that. Right? But, so the doors and the windows let things in and out. So your membrane's selectively permeable, meaning that it lets some things in and out, but it keeps other things from coming in. So... This is a lecture about how things get into a cell and out of a cell. And there's two ways that it can happen, passive or active. And whenever you see the word passive or active, because you will see it again, it just means do you need energy or do you not need energy? Passive requires no energy. Active requires energy. And I'll give you an example, like a practical example. Breathing in is an active process. That means that somewhere in your body, you need energy to breathe in. And so, yeah, you have muscles that contract in your, like your diaphragm. You have muscles that contract in your body, and that makes your lungs get bigger. 
So that's an active process because you have muscle contraction, but your lungs are elastic. So when they get bigger to make them go like this again, it's, it's elastic. So that's a breathing out is passive. It does not take any effort or energy to breathe out. It just automatically happens. So if you see people trying to breathe out, then they probably have COPD. Something's wrong. You're not supposed to try to breathe out. I mean, you know, if you're just sitting, right? If you're like running and stuff, that's different. But if you're just hanging out, you shouldn't be trying to breathe out. So when people do that, you know something's wrong. So breathing in is active. Breathing out is passive. So same words, things move around your body actively or passively. Either you use energy or you don't. Most of the time it's passive. We, we, things get around our body just by this process called diffusion. And diffusion is, um, you know, when you take a, a, a drop of food coloring or something, and you put it in a glass of water, it doesn't stay as the drop, right? It diffuses out until it colors the whole glass the same color, right? It's not like one red drop at the top. No, it starts to get lighter and lighter until the whole thing of water is one color. That's diffusion. So you go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Or you can say like, high density to low density. That's what's happening here. <clears throat> so pretend this is the cell membrane and on the left side, we have things outside of the cell and on the right side, you have inside the cell, right? They're gonna move in until they are equal on both sides and then it'll stop. And so um, that's diffusion. So we call this, we can call this a concentration gradient. So when I say it moves along the concentration gradient or it moves with the concentration gradient, concentration gradient, I'm saying diffusion. It's gonna do, it's gonna do what you see in this photo. It's just gonna keep moving across until it's equal on both sides. And so that's what cells will do a lot. Like how do we get things in, how do we get oxygen into a cell? Well, if there's more oxygen outside the cell than there is inside, the oxygen is just going to move in. The oxygen will go from wherever, from higher to lower concentration. So that's it. If there's more oxygen in your blood than there is in that cell, the oxygen is going to come out of your blood and go into your cell. And carbon dioxide will do the same thing. If there's more carbon dioxide inside your cell than there is in the blood, that carbon dioxide is going to move out of your cell and into your blood until it equalizes. So that's how we get things around our body. But that's how things move into your cell or out of your cell. Higher to lower concentration until it reaches an equilibrium. And that's diffusion. That's what diffusion is. So you should definitely know like a definition for diffusion. And that's it. Higher to lower concentration, or you can say higher to lower density. <clears throat> nope. Too soon, too soon, too soon, too soon. Whoa, what's up? Okay. So here's like an example of it. Both of these are passive, right? So this is, and so what a lot of things will do is they'll simply squeeze in between these, uh, the phospholipid bilayer, and it will move in, right? So you can already see how many of these circles are going to move in. Well, I don't know. I don't want to count it, but it's going to keep moving. It's going to keep moving like this until they equal out. Here, facilitated diffusion is still diffusion. It's just that sometimes you got to help things get in. So if you think about like, um, I don't know, Disneyland, you know, how do they, you know, people, when you go to enter Disneyland, you go through those uh, turnstiles, right? But not everybody 
can use the turnstile. What if you have like a stroller uh, or like a wheelchair or what if it's like a bus full of kids and you just want to let everybody in at once, right? You open the gate. So they, they're going to use a gate to get in. And that's like facilitated diffusion. So we have like a protein that's embedded in this membrane. And it's like a gate. So I want you to know when. When do you have to use this gate? When do you have to use a protein to get in? So some different cases. One, if the molecule's too big, right? So that's pretty easy. If the molecule's too big, you got to open the gate and let it in. So you have to use facilitated diffusion. If it has a charge, so an ion, anything that's positive or negative. So for example, all of our minerals that are in our body have charges, sodium, potassium, calcium, whatever it is, they're, ch they're charged. They're positive or they're negative. So you, they can't go through. They won't fit through. So they need to use a gate. They use a special, we call them like a channel. So I guess you, a word for this would be a channel. So they use special channels to let them in and out. When you're, um, for example, like uh, like Novocaine and stuff, it's a they call it like a calcium channel blocker. So it'll it'll close these gates that are supposed to let calcium. You're using calcium to like hit your pain nerves, and what Novocaine will do, or whatever they're using, like one of the things it'll do is it shuts these calcium channels. So calcium cannot get into the nerve and then so you don't actually feel the pain it's unable to communicate but anyway i don't know i don't know why that came into my head but facilitated diffusion versus regular diffusion if something has a charge if something is too large or a third way <clears throat> if i want to move a lot of something just like if there's a bus of kids and i want to let them through i don't want each of them going through that turnstile Right, same thing here. If you have a lot of water, for example, right? If we have a little bit of water, we can move it through through the wall. It just kind of squeezes through and it goes into a cell. But what if we want to get a lot of water into a cell or a lot of water out of a cell? Then we got to open these special gates. You don't have to remember it, but they're called aquaporins. You'll see that word again. For example, you notice that when you drink a lot of coffee, you have to pee. Okay, why then? Like, why does it happen more with coffee or more with alcohol than with other drinks? Right, because they're they're opening these gates inside your kidneys. Just like certain places in your kidneys, they open these these gates, these aquaporins, and that lets water move through, through even faster. So, um, so those are both examples of passive transport. Just the question is, do you need help with it or not? That's the difference between facilitated and regular diffusion. But it's still diffusion. Now, sometimes you want to go the opposite direction. So you want to go against the concentration gradient. Right, and this, this this happens in real life. If you think about like, think about Kenner, like new Kenner, with all those homes with like 150 lights shining up on the house. How arrogant, huh? How can you go look go look at those like fancy houses if you go through? Why do they have to have all these lights shining up on their house? Like I don't get it. Just vain. It's like a constant. Look at me. Got 60 lights coming from the ground, shining in from the soffits, shining on my house. Wasting all that electricity. Look at me. I'm a big house. Okay, anyway. Why doesn't that area flood? Well, we got a levee, right? So, but really what happens is that Lake Pontchartrain 
that water wants to go into Kenner because there's no water in Kenner and there's all the water in the Pontchartrain. So that would be diffusion. It's a natural process. You put a hole in that levee, all the water is going to just flood in, right? It won't flood till up forever. That water will flood until the levels are the same in Lake Pontchartrain and Kenner. Then it'll stop. That's diffusion. Higher concentration to lower concentration. We have to we have to put the water from Kenner into Lake Pontchartrain. So that's an active process. We need to turn on these pumps and we need to pump it out because it's not natural. We shouldn't have built there. It's not, it's not a natural thing to take a swamp and like, you know what? I'm going to put an $800,000 house here with 60 lights shining on it. It's not natural. So we have to pump the water out. And in order to do that, we need energy. You have to have electricity to run those pumps. Same thing with a cell. Sometimes your cell wants to push things in or push things out against the concentration gradient. So you see all the green squares are inside the cell, but still we want to push these last two inside. And you don't want any of these coming out. Why does your cell do that? Uh, we could, that's a future chapter, but it happens sometimes. Your cell uses active transport to go against the concentration gradient you know in other words against diffusion it's going against what makes sense to you right so you're moving in the opposite direction that's active transport and so you need you need some kind of energy like atp you need some kind of energy to do that so what is active transport active means you need energy so the word active set means energy but we're going against the concentration gradient or against diffusion. Um, this is a very typical thing that, well, I'm not, we'll talk about that later. Don't forget, what do we call H pluses? I, the word's right here. We call them protons. Okay, so there is an example here. So let's talk about like why your body would do it. So I want to get sucrose sugar. I want to get it into the cell. But I can open the gate, but they're not coming in. So I need, how do I get them in? Right? I'm a cell. I can't go out and call them and collect them. So what, what's going to happen here is that normally, under normal circumstances, you have – I'm just giving you a number here. You have 100 protons inside and 100 protons outside. I'm just coming up with a number, right? So equal amounts. 100 protons inside, 100 protons outside. There's no movement. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the 100 protons inside and I'm going to pump them all out. So that's active transport, right? Because at the end of this, I'm going to end up with 200 protons outside and no protons inside. So that's what your body will do. It'll pump these protons out. I'm doing it because for a reason, because I want to get sucrose inside. And what will happen is that the protons are going to get pumped out. They grab onto sucrose and then they diffuse back in, right? Because when I have 200 protons outside and I have none inside, a hundred of them want to come back in again. So fine, come on back in. But on your way back in, grab a sucrose molecule. So we call that like co-transport, right? So pumping it out is active. Having the, high, the, the, the protons go right back in again, that's passive. So if I pump 100 out, the 100 are going to want to turn around and come back in. <coughs> So on the way back in, they're grabbing sucrose. That's an example of why a cell would want to use active transport. You guys have any questions so far? I shouldn't have too much longer left. Nope. 
This is a cell taking stuff in, right? There's three different processes. The first one is the one you're really going to see that word. And we already talked about it, phagocytosis. Well, actually, these are all types of endocytosis. So endo meaning in, exo meaning out. So cyto means cell. So endocytosis, cell in, cells taking stuff in. How can we do it? Well, one way is that you just eat it. So here's a, an amoeba eating a bacteria. You can kind of see what happens. It like makes these little, call them like pseudopods, but it makes, it like surrounds it and engulfs it and drags it in. So that's called phagocytosis. Phago meaning eat, and cyto meaning cell, cell eating. <clears throat> in fact, the words used all the time, we use this word, word as a verb. This cell will phagocytize this, right? So it means like it'll eat it. So you'll see the word a lot. And then there's like things called macrophages, phagocytes. Those are different cells that eat stuff. So don't forget the word. So phagocytosis, cell eating. Penocytosis, cell drinking. Um, and then third, receptor-mediated endocytosis. This just means you have a receptor and receptors are looking for specific things. So receptor-mediated cytosis is looking for one thing only. Whereas phagocytosis or penocytosis, you might drink whatever's out there, <clears throat> right? Receptor-mediated is looking for one thing. To give you an example, you've got a gland, thyroid gland up in your neck, right about here, and it uses iodine. And it's the only thing in your body pretty much that uses iodine. So you get iodine from things like shellfish, right? So you're eating crawfish. How does that, that, you know, that iodine circulating in your bloodstream, why doesn't the iodine, why don't you just pee it out? Or why doesn't it go down to your feet and get stuck there or go to your brain? Like, why does it just go here? Because your thyroid gland is the only thing with the receptors. So these receptors are looking just for iodine. And when it sees iodine go by, it'll grab it and drag it into the cell. That's what receptor-mediated endocytosis is. Receptor-mediated is looking for one specific thing not just anything. So cell eating, cell drinking, whatever, whatever's out there, right? And then receptor mediated, looking for something very specific. Those are ways the cell, those are other ways the cell can take things in. So as you see here, these aren't going through the plasma membrane. The cell is grabbing it and pulling it in. So it's like another way that something can get into the cell besides just going through the cell wall, uh, through the membrane. I've got one more thing to tell you about. And it's right there. These two words, there's actually three words. You're going to see this as well. <clears throat> Hypotonic, hypertonic. And then there's something called is isotonic. So this concerns osmosis. So osmosis is the diffusion of water. So water diffuses around our body. But water will act a little bit different because water will follow solutes. And what's a solute? A solute is just something that you put in that's going to like dissolve. Let me give you some examples of solutes instead. Sodium is like a real common solute, right? So water follows salt or water follows sodium really. So water, wherever sodium is, water is going to follow it. If you pee sodium out, you're going to pee out more water. 
if your body decides to not pee sodium, you're going to keep the sodium and you're going to keep water. You're going to keep more water in your body. So that's a very common, you know, people that have high blood pressure, that's some of their medicine. Their medicine works to expel sodium. And by expelling sodium, you're going to also pee out more water. And by doing that, you're going to have less blood in your body. That'll make your blood pressure go down. Right, so when you see people are on like when people say they're on water pills, um, often that's what's happening. They're actually on like sodium pills because water follows sodium. So they want to pee sodium out to get rid of water. <clears throat> so water follows, and, and another example is albumin. Your blood has albumin in it, and I don't know why I'm pointing here like that. Oh, blood, your blood, your blood has sodium in it. I mean, albumin, and that's like another thing that water will follow. So you're going to hear about albumin in future, in future classes, right? And because your body uses it to move water. If I take albumin and I put it, and I put it in the blood, water is going to come into my blood. If I take albumin and I put it outside your blood vessel, like outside your capillary, water is going to leave my blood and go out. So... Um, anyway, water follows solutes like sodium. So wherever there's more sodium, that's where water wants to be. And so these words here are talking about like sodium or talking about whatever solute it is. In this case, we're talking, we're going to use the example of sodium. So whatever has more sodium is hypertonic. Whatever has less sodium is hypotonic. So let's use the example of imagine a glass of drinking water, and then you have a glass of seawater, water from the ocean. Right? Obviously, the seawater is more salty than the regular water out of your tap. So in that case, now I can use these two words. The seawater is hypertonic because it hyper meaning more. The regular water is hypotonic because it has less salt in it. So you got to use the word, I need both. Like I can't just take a glass of water and say, oh, this is hypotonic. Well, compared to what? Right, you have to compare it to something. So now it's weird. It's like counterintuitive. But water actually likes the place that has more salt. And it seems like it would be the opposite. Like, so if I was a water molecule and I had a glass of salt water and a glass of regular water, if I were a water molecule, I'm going to want to go into the salt water. That's preferable. I know it doesn't make sense, um, but that's just know that's what it does. Right? And so... Um, believe it or not, it seems like the salt water would be more dense, but the salt water is like, it's not, it's less dense. So it's a place of lower concentration of water. Salt water has like a lower density of water. It's a weird concept. Um, <clears throat> let me explain it in this way. Imagine you have like two classrooms. Right, and each classroom has 25 students in it. And so, you know, the, you spread out. You sit on, you go to your desk, you, f you start sitting in the back, a couple of you nerds will sit in the very front, and the middle's kind of empty, but it'll eventually fill in, right? You're not gonna have, like if there's 50 chairs in the classroom, you're not gonna have like all 25 people just on one end of the classroom. Right? No, you spread out. Think of an elevator, right? You don't get on the elevator and like stand right next to the person, right? You spread out as, as you naturally put an equal distance between you guys on an elevator, right? So that's what, I mean, that's what we, that's what we do. We tend to diffuse ourselves, right? And so, um, but imagine we have a classroom and you put, Think of somebody famous in your head, right? You put someone famous in that classroom. 
So what are you guys going to do? You're all going to go surround yourselves around that famous person because you want to get selfies with them to put it on your account. All right. So now I have two classrooms. I have one classroom that everybody's like sitting in their desk. It's all everyone's spread out. I have another classroom <clears throat> where everybody's up in the corner and you're up on that famous person trying to take selfies with them and all the desks are empty. So I've got a choice. What classroom do I want to go hang out in? I want to go in the one with the famous person in it because all those desks are empty. I could take a desk and sit in it. I could take another desk and put my feet up on it. I could take another desk and put my backpack on it. And I've got lots of room, right? Each class has 25 people, but the one with the famous person inside, which is sodium, all the 25 people are around that person. So I've got lots of room. That's what salt is like. Salt's like a famous person. All the water wants to be around it. And so there's like lots of room now. I don't know if that makes any sense, but if you don't, if that didn't make any sense, and I get it because I don't, sometimes I use horrible analogies, but just remember, water always goes from hypotonic to hypertonic. Water always goes wherever there's more sodium. Then you're going to be good. So let me give you, and I'm going to end this paper. What's that? All you got to think of is like, for instance, hyper, like excitement. Yeah. Yeah, you want to be where all the excitement is. Your, take your blood, for example. Your blood's salty. It's got about, it's a little bit less than 1% salt. 0.9% salt. So your blood's salty. So inside your blood cells, your red blood cells, is 0.9% salt. Outside of your blood cells, in the plasma, you know, the liquid that the, that the blood cells float in, that's also 0.9% salt. It's equal. So the salt in your blood cells and the salt out of your blood cells is exactly equal. And you want it to be like that. But let's say we give you an IV. If you look at the IVs, an IV bag always has, well, almost always has 0.9% salt in it. It'll say on it 0.9% sodium chloride. That's for a reason because it's iso, iso mini equal, isotonic. We don't want to put, we want to give you fluid. We want to give you an IV and give you fluid, but we don't want to make it more salty or less salty because either way, you're going to screw things up in your blood. <clears throat> so let's say we just put water. Like this person's dehydrated. I'm going to put an IV of just pure water without salt. Okay, so now the IV goes into your vein and we're putting regular water into this person's body. So the plasma starts to become diluted, like it's less salty. So the plasma will be like 0.5% salt. The inside of your blood cells will be 0.9% salt. So now you've created this hypotonic and hypertonic. Your plasma is hypotonic. Your blood cells are hypertonic. And now all the water wants to go inside of your cells because you've created this imbalance. So all the water will go in your blood cells and it'll make them pop because you don't want the blood cells to be more salty than the plasma. So you want to keep that balance. So that's why IV bags almost always have 0.9% sodium chloride. Because you want to put in your plasma whatever it is, whatever balance they've got, you want to keep it like that. So isotonic. So they're always going to be isotonic. right? And if we were to give an IV that's too salty, 1% or 2% sodium chloride or 1% or 2% salt, right? you're going to make the opposite thing happen. You're going to make the plasma hypertonic. The plasma is too salty. 
and then the blood cells will start to shrivel up because all the water will leave the red blood cell and go out into the plasma. So you're, you're screwing up the balance. So that's like a practical application of it, right? Whenever you give someone an IV, if you ever see an IV bag, look at it, it's going to say 0.9% sodium chloride. All right, so it's isotonic. You're giving an isotonic solution. So you'll see those words, isotonic and hypotonic and hypertonic. So just know that water moves from hypotonic to hypertonic. That is my last slide from that. And do you guys have any questions? I'm going to stop recording. Do you have anything that 